Right, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready for the next presentation. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Paul Burns to you again. Paul Burns is uh, with us from America. What part of America, Paul? I'm living in Florida now. Florida? Tallahassee, nice. Florida. Tallahassee, so, Florida. You know where to find him. And uh, Paul is going to talk to, talk to us about the Tano burn of Leinster as defined by its DNA. Now, uh, Paul spent 30 years uh, doing intelligence work, uh, much of the time in Latin America, and later as a private investigator. Uh, he's been involved in genealogy and genetic genealogy for many years, and his Clan O'Byrne and Burns DNA project is one of the largest on Family Tree DNA, and probably one of the first ones to start as well. Well, it's, it's January 2005. I wasn't one of the first, but it's, uh, it does go way back. And the project is one of the top 100 of the 8,000, I think, in a surname projects that they have. That's fascinating. Or, or maybe so, it's 8,000 surnames, I forget which. <laughs> well, Paul is going to tell us all about Clan O'Byrne, so I can ask you to give, you a, a give Paul a warm welcome. Thank you. Okay, well, this uh, lecture concerns just one portion of uh, pro the project, which I described yesterday. Uh, it's the largest uh, portion of uh, the burn, burn, burns. It's three different spellings, B-U-R-N-S, B-Y-R-N-E, B-E-I-R-N-E, uh, that, w that uh, we have in the title of the project, though we have many other similar, uh, phonetically similar uh, surnames uh, tested as well. I put a chart of the whole project on the back wall, just uh, not that I'm going to point to it, but just so uh, so you can see the great diversity of it. Um, all that on the top, all that purple, that's the uh, that's the clan of Burn of Leinster, and uh, 94 of our members are in the core group of that clan. Um, if we include the other haplo groups. That is, the people who uh, uh, really were part of the clan but are not members of that core group, who did not have the, the, uh, the uh, SNP indicator that designates them, and I'll get into all this, um, were included. It would probably be about 33% of our total project. <coughs> now, um, well, first let me introduce Richard. Richard, just raise your hand, please. He's co-administrator of the project, and he lives in Wexford. And... Uh, he joined us last year as co well. He's been in the project for some time. Joined us as co-administrator, and it's a great uh, help to us because he's here in Ireland. When I'm back in the states, of course, and our other co-administrator lives in the United States too. But uh, Richard keeps a supply of test kits handy. If there's anyone in the room who's a burn or similarity and wants to test Y DNA, see him, please. <laughs> now we are a Y DNA project only, as I said, and. Uh, Though I get frequent requests to join the project from people who have a burn in their maternal ancestry, we can't really help them just, uh, because we don't test. And the only advantage to joining the project is to have your, your marker values, the SDR values, added and uh, analyzed by us and added to that, uh, that big chart that we have. Um, I have to explain where the clan came from, or at least where we think it came from, before I get into the DNA. Uh, there's many myths about the origin of the clan O'Byrne, or better to say the, uh, the, the uh, I've also said Lagan, and I've been corrected recently, the Lane, Lion, Lion, I guess it is, uh, of which the clan was a part. Uh, legend associated the name Leinster with the Lane Pen Peninsula in uh, Wales, and while well, others, uh, Let's see how this thing works. There we go. Others uh, have opined that the Leinster tribes, including the O'Burns, probably came from the Dumnoni, who started out in Armorica back in BC times, moved on to, uh, to Devon. Now, let's see. Yeah, here we go. There and uh, then spread up the Irish Sea, some settling here. This is the Pto Ptolemy's map of about 250 AD, I think it is. Uh, doesn't, yeah, right here, Dunane. And while well, others moved further up and settled in Scotland, and we do have some genetic association with some of the Scottish tribes. 
especially the, a, a, a group called the Beides. Uh, but anyway, um, just recently, there's been, uh, in fact, the past couple of weeks, one of the uh, um, experts has come up with uh, a new SNP that connects the Clano Burns identifier, which is called Z255, with another group called uh, Z253, which is pretty much, uh, it's pretty certain that that's of Irish origin, so now that throws that whole thing into, into question, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, it's going to take a couple of months before we really know uh, if that holds uh, fast, then uh, it will show that the uh, Leinster groups really are, are of Irish origin and not, uh, not of uh, Cornwall, I guess you'd say, or, or French. But anyway, um, about 400 AD, I think um, it, this is fairly well verified by history, a uh, two tribes moved up from Ossory into Leinster. One was called the E. Chenseleg, and the other was called the E. Dunlange. You know, the E. Chenseleg stayed in the southern part, there it is there, southern part of, of uh, Leinster, and eventually became the McMurroughs, the Cavanaugh's, uh, Kinchillas, and I don't know what a, a, a certain other tribes as well. Well, the Dunlange went further north, and uh, I'm not sure it's even named on the map. And then event later on, about 700 AD, split into the E. Wurdeg, the E. Fuelan, and the, the tribe over here, the E. Dunjata, there it is. Uh, we're only concerned, or I'm only concerned, with the E. Fuelan. Which is the parent group of the uh, Clan O'Byrne. Uh, it was based around Nace in North Leinster, while the E. Muradeg uh, was a little further south, and, and that eventually became the O'Tools. The, the, the uh, E. Fuelan uh, provided a great many kings of Leinster in the early days, as well as you know tribal kings, and uh, was quite powerful in. Leinster uh, politics up until the, uh, the Battle of Clontarf, when it was pretty much decimated by uh, Brian Baru and his forces. Now it was the uh, Bri it was the uh, E. Phelan that really led the uh, opposition to Brian at that battle, not the not the Vikings as uh, legend would have it. But anyway, uh, so many of them were killed that the power then shifted to the E. Chensula. Uh, in, the, in the south, and uh, with Dermot McMurrow, and you know that story, I'm sure. The e Phelan lands were taken over by the Normans that, that uh, Dermot brought in uh, about the year 1177, 1178, and many histories say that the Normans forced the e Phelan up into the Wicklows, but uh, the truth is, uh, the research now has it that uh, E. Phelan up into this area, that the uh, E. Phelan, uh, that a faction of the E. Phelan known as E. Bran, after a king of, uh, I think the king of Leinster as well, named Bran, uh, lost out in an internal political struggle in the E. Phelan, and uh, was, was forced up about 1052, thereabouts, to uh, settle around... Akras, I'm not sure they've done the map, probably not. Akras, uh, Akram, and uh, Shalala in the south of, uh, of the Wick, uh, Wicklow. And that's where the uh, Clan O'Byrne really began. This is a map that one of the members drew up, Val Byrne, who was at one time the chieftain of the elected chieftain of the clan. And uh, the clan as it grew, it was formed about 1200 AD, the clan as it grew uh, divided into a junior branch and a senior branch. Senior branch is called the 
Croke Brana in the junior branch was uh, the, uh, the Dowell Ranel, I have to pardon my pronunciation of Irish terms. But uh, the reason, uh, it was kind of a late form clan, about 1200, but it, it survived long after many of the other, most of the other clans were destroyed or, or subdued, as a better word to say, by the, uh, by the Normans because of its isolation in the Wicklow Mountains and the difficulty of the, uh, uh, the uh, Anglo-Norman forces getting up there to uh, put it down, uh, to conquer it. This, for example, let, some of these slides I showed yesterday, if uh, those of you who are we're here then. The Battle of Glenmalure in 1580 is quite famous when they say about 800 Anglo invaders were were killed by the uh, by the Leinster forces up in the hills. Now, uh, before passing on to the uh, DNA aspects of the uh, of the clan, um, I want to point out a couple of my major sources for what, for what I know about it. This is a book by a man named Emmett O'Byrne, who uh, is quite an authority on the Klan, has written this book and written many essays as well on it, War Politics in the Irish of Leinster, 1156-1606. Uh, he's the current elected head of the, the Klan. And uh, also uh, a series of books, there's my name on the cover, but really it's by Daniel Byrne Rothwell. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's been three volumes published, and two more volumes are going to come out. It's, it's uh, uh, quite a, it's the last word in, uh, in what we know about that particular clan. I'm not of the clan, incidentally. I'm Northwest Irish. Uh, Richard here, however, is. Now, the... Uh, My association with the Klan, though, began with my great-grandfather, who wrote a memoir about the year 1900, tracing himself back five or six generations. He lived in County Sligo, but he said that we descended from the Clan O'Byrne of Leinster through a Jacobite cavalry officer named Patrick O'Byrne, who fled from Wicklow, well, actually fled from the Battle of Ockram in Galway in 1691, fled north to Sligo, and settled there. Well, uh, as I sp spent about 20 years, 25 years, trying to verify that, and I couldn't. And eventually, when I had myself DNA tested, I discovered, uh, I don't know where he got the information, because it wasn't true at all. Um, I did early on, when I had myself tested, in January 2005, I, I tested a uh, Valburn, who, as I said at the time, was the elected chief of the Klan. And uh, he was probably the first member which uh, in the year 2005, uh, by the end of the year, we had just nine members of this uh, Clan O'Byrne tested. And uh, Val, uh, I, found, I found that of the nine, that seven of them had surprisingly close DNA. So I thought right over the, that, that early that we might have a, a Clan profile. And it, uh, to my surprise, Later on, it, it held true, and as more people joined us, uh, by the end, uh, we had 10 members at the end of the first year, and uh, the project itself grew to about 100 members at the end of uh, the second year, and right now we have about 375, but because I said only about 95 are, are this uh, Clan O'Byrne. Um, the burn model that we first tested and which proved uh, reliable was later adopted as the Leinster model because it seemed to apply to other Leinster surnames as well. And today they call the Irish Sea model because of uh, some association with uh, the, uh, the Beatties and other uh, surnames across the, across the Irish Sea on the other side. I showed this again yesterday. The let's see. This this is the Burns. It's of not too much interest to the Clan O'Byrne because you see very few B U R N S in this area, which is the uh, the Wicklow's. 
The V Y RNA, on the other hand, that is obviously very much concentrated in uh, in, in Leinster. There are some some other off the supposed offshoots. They thought they were offshoots, which I'll mention a little bit later. Uh, that turned out not to be the Donegal Group, a, a uh, Monaghan Group, Louth Group, and uh, I thought. Uh, well, anyway, the, the Burns, where I come from, right up in there. We, the story was that we were from the from the uh, the Wicklow's, but uh, we are over there in the Burns. But obviously, we weren't. And the Breens, who uh, are a small part of our project, but uh, we do have some Breens who seem to tie in to the Clan O'Byrne, and they uh, are in this area down here. I don't have any Breens up in here, and I don't know what they are. We have a group of Breens over here uh, in Kerry, but uh, they are of a different uh, uh, DNA entirely. <clears throat> now, we're talking about uh, SNPs, SN and SNPs, and STRs. Um, I'm trying to make this as non-technical as possible, but this is a chart of the human race by SNPs. SNPs occur much more rarely, a SNP mutation than an STR mutation, so it's uh, much, much better for for uh, tracing ancestry, deep ancestry. Now the A, I think, uh, Morris, you mentioned a figure the other day, I've been carrying 125,000 years back to the uh, origin uh, of haplogroup A. I may be wrong on that, but anyway, as, the, as time went on down the thousands, down the millenniums, it, the, uh, the step map kept enlarging, 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 enlarging until we get down to R1B and about 80% of Irish or R1B, and the Clan O'Byrne being one of them. This map just shows the portion of R1B that is L21. There's other portions, and uh, this map has actually changed in the last couple of weeks. The whole field is advancing so fast, but it's just to show the, uh, there's about 200 major <coughs> subclades under L21, I said 80% of Irish are L21. The only portion we're really concerned with in this lecture is right here, and the clan O'Byrne is right, right there on this, uh, this portion of the chart. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a position on the chart that it's uh, the most, the lowest or the, the most recent. It's just one of many, and actually goes back pretty far up, and it should be up here if this were arranged by, uh, by age. Now this is uh, the way I chart the uh, the marker values when a test comes back in. There's an L21 model up here in the gray, and if uh, this is a, just a portion of the clan O'Byrne, and if they all were had no mutations at all, this would all be a sea of purple, just just purple. But uh, different colors show the markers that have mutated, and as you can see there are certain ones that are common over here, over here, to, uh, to the clan O'Byrne. And if we get a new result in showing four or five or six of these um, the same mutations, the ones that we, we consider part of this, what we placed in the model for the, for the clan, then we know we placed the person properly. Now, early on, um, I start using uh, software to help out here, and uh, it soon became apparent, this is the type of software called Fluxus that I used to use years ago, that uh, I could identify some sub-branches of the clan O'Byrne by their position on this particular type of software. This, here's one here, here's one here, but the, the, there was a big core, a big main group, and uh, that seemed to be, uh, everyone seemed to be very close in genetically, and that became the, uh, eventually the core group of the 
of the project of the plan. Now here's, here's another phonetic chart, and I found this much more useful in, in time. It's by a man named Howard, a retired astronomer. And you can actually, on this one, without uh, my interpreting, you can see the, uh, the way the, the, uh, the program identifies families. I'm going around, there's one right there. Uh, here's one down here, and so on and so forth. This just shows the uh, portion of that previous chart. Uh, we're uh, under Z255, which is the uh, kind of the, uh, the identifying SNP, was the identifying SNP, and in time, of course, we discovered uh, branches of it. Uh, the clan O'Byrne, the, the, the most of the, the, all of the 95 that I mentioned, 94 members, are in this particular one right here. And lastly, this chart, um, by Alex Williamson is based mostly on big Y testing and full genome testing. And uh, we were fortunate enough to get, I think it's six, or is it seven? One, two, three, four. I think six members of uh, the clan will burn to take the test. And uh, this shows all the various mutations that they have. Uh, down here is a burn, 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 burn. Win. Now, there's a group of winds in South Leinster. I'm sure that's where he comes in. And burn. And then another one over here, another burn. It doesn't seem to tie in as closely as these do. Now, these, uh, these are where they all come together. These six are under Z16950. That's the name of SNP. Um, and... Uh, Four of them are under a SNP here that doesn't have a name because they cannot individually test it. It's too flaky. And I'm hoping they'll, that they'll be rectified because it's, it, it, it seems to be a, a close in, 300 years later, perhaps, than, than that one. And so on back to Z255, which is way up there. Now, they've been able to put an age to... Uh, well, they're figuring, the way they do it is they figure uh, there's an average 150 years between SNPs. And using that, and let me go back here. Using that, they count the number of SNPs up here to the common denominator, the, the common SNP. And from that, these, these people were in the present, of course taking an average birth year of 1950 or so and working backwards, 150 per SNP, they, they figure the age of that and the age of that and the age of Z255 itself as what this is showing, Z255 3700 BC, um, the main group of those four was uh, at about 1100 BC, uh, AD, and uh, the same with these others. There's, there's a little bit of difference, but let's say they're both about 1100. And the age of the SNP, the Z16950, that uh, encompasses five of the six, and actually more, because I individually SNP tested three other project members, so we have eight who tested that. So we have a very good indicator in Z19, 16950. Uh, and then up above, uh, well, uh, the, uh, the, the, that, that odd uh, one, this, this one over here, who, who is Z255, but it's of an older branch of the clan. Uh, he comes in higher up, about 300 years earlier. I think it's uh, right there, yeah. About 300 years, two snips earlier. Well, I took Bill Howard's chart, which is STR-based, and um, 
divided it into major families. And those red arrows show the six people who tested big Y. And these blue arrows show those three individuals that I tested with Y, y sec just for the Z16950. And it, it, it all fit very nicely together. And my family seemed fairly well identified by this. And that one who tied in uh, much earlier, obviously here is not a family. This line goes way up. This, this is not quite, this doesn't seem to fit in that, that portion there. This is a time scale going out here. And uh, the time scale, the gold line is uh, Z16950, and it seems to fit. That, this, this, is a, that, this is SNP based, while well, this uh, is uh, STR based, but it's, it does fit in very nicely uh, in, in time. And the blue line, which is that lower SNP that encompasses four of the families, uh, also fit in well with Bill Howard's uh, predicted time to, the, near, to the, uh, the common ancestor of each, of each group. <clears throat> this thing doesn't want to turn off. Okay, um, but that's the core group, and that's, uh, they have a single primogenitor, the 95 members of that core group, but they're not, they don't, they're not all of the clan O'Byrne. There were many others in the clan um, who tested, uh, did not test uh, um, Z255, and some actually test haplogroups that go back thousands of years. Well, some of them are Viking. We, we, find we have about 10 people in the project who, uh, whose ancestors lived along the coast, perhaps, and uh, they're mostly haplogroup I1, and uh, uh, the ancestors probably settled there 800 AD, 900 AD. And of course, they, after a couple generations, they didn't know that they were uh, descended from Vikings. And uh, when the clan was formed in 1200 AD, they were just swept up, given the surname O'Byrne. And uh, nobody knew until they tested recently. In uh, Last October, just a year ago, we had a uh, recruitment drive in, uh, in the Wicklows. It was mostly Richard's work and uh, my other co-administrator. And uh, they recruited 42 new members. It's just to show you the, the diversity. 32 turned out to be in the core group, the haplogroup Z255. Uh, but 10, 10 had different half groups entirely. These are people with a surname Burn who, who, uh, who, who live uh, in, in Leinster and who, as far as they knew, their ancestors had always lived there too. But uh, of 10 of them, that's fully 20, uh, one, one fourth, had different half groups. One is an M222, that's Northwest Irish. Uh, DEF 49 probably is very close to 222, it was just above it. They're from Wexford. Uh, this is a Brian Baru, and he's the third one of the project. Uh, and then an R1A, which is mostly Eastern Europe, and uh, J2, which is uh, Eastern Mediterranean, or North Africa. And uh, then some unknowns, four unknowns, we, we don't yet know what their, uh, what their background is. But it, 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 uh, it backs up that, uh, uh, that the clan was geographic in, in, uh, in nature and not, uh, not all primogenitor. Now, um, again, this is a slide I showed yesterday. There's, there's many groups in Ireland that think they descend from uh, the clan O'Byrne, and DNA is showing that they certainly do not. We, uh, that, that's my, uh, my family up there in Sligo. There was a group in Mayo that believes that the DNA shows us not uh, from, from Leinster, not the clan. The Donegal, a big group of Donegal, and uh, then over here in Lout and uh, Monaghan, there are several groups that, uh, whose oral history is that they are, were people sent up to aid the O'Neill or, or the O'Connell. And uh, were given land in return and, and, and settled down uh, in, in those areas. But uh, 
uh, as I said, they, they are a different haplogroup entirely, so that, that story is no more accurate than is my family history. Uh, I told this story yesterday, but I'll, I'll tell it again briefly because uh, uh, these people are Z255. They are a member of, uh, of the clan O'Burn of Leinster. That I was approached a while back by a man in New Zealand some years ago now named Valdez, uh, a Mexican name. He's called El Bornis. No, it concerned a man named El Bornis, who was a local politician and ranch owner, um, who surname was Burns. He came from Minnesota, but his father had migrated from, from uh, Waterford, supposedly. And uh, he impregnated a servant girl who had a baby. or That's what the man who approached me said. He said his uh, servant girl was his great-grandmother. She had a boy baby, boy baby, boy baby. So, so Joe, uh, Joe Valdez was asking if DNA would help prove that this Burns had, had done that. And uh, I said, we can certainly try. We tested his DNA, and he was a perfect match with a man from New Zealand whose, whose uh, ancestors had migrated from Kilkenny to New Zealand three generations early. 67 67 match and uh, the man in uh, New Zealand who incidentally had moved to Washington by then Washington DC uh, had been in touch with uh, a man who occupies Clara Castle or at least farms the land around Clara Castle in Kilkenny and uh, thinking that, that they uh, were related and he, he agreed to, to test too and he's 67 60, 66 67 to the other two so obviously uh, his, his theory was, was correct, and uh, uh, I think all three were happy with the story. Now, uh, uh, not that Joe can do much with the information, because I, I don't think he's interested in a lawsuit, he just wanted to know. <laughs> okay, well that's, um, just to summarize what we've learned, I've learned a lot just preparing this lecture, um, it, whether DNA has determined the clan's origins, not really and not yet, but we are in the process, and I think uh, sooner than later we, we're, we're going to be pinned down whether the clan does come from the Dumnoni, whether it's of Irish origin, um, or whether it came over from Wales or whatever. And has DNA verified the, the e-brain moved, uh, origin theory, that is that they moved up from uh, in a tribal dispute in 1052 to uh, the southern Wicklows? Um, it's hard to say. Again, there, there are Breens in the project, uh, one, one of whom is present in the room. And uh, it, it Let's, it's been, all we can say right now is that we haven't disproved that, uh, that, that theory. Um, and thirdly, is DA helping to separate the senior from the junior branch? Well, probably not. I think the two branches are, are more political than they are um, separated by, uh, by bloodlines. They haven't had enough time really to develop separately, and there's been probably a lot of intermarriage over the years since they, they're not that far apart geographically. And uh, lastly, is DNA of assistance in separating families and determining uh, MRCA? Well, that's what we're working on right now, is, is trying to do just that, is divide the, uh, uh, the clan O'Burn into family lineages by paper trail. It all has to come back to paper trail tracing, and uh, I wish we had some better uh, paper trails. Some of our members think they can go back to the 1500s, but, but uh, not everyone accepts that. Now, Gerald Corcoran just last night was saying that what we need across the board in, in YDNA is some, some, uh, some very solid pedigrees going back thousands or more years, if possible, that we can then match the mutation rates and finally decide whether 
uh, this 150 years is accurate or not. Uh, I don't agree with the 150 years, but I don't have any evidence yet. If the mutation, the average mutation was 100 years apart, then those uh, dates that I put up there on that previous screen would change drastically and would be more in line with what we know about the, the clan's history and what we, we believe we know about the clan's history. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, until, uh, until more people test, there's no way to really say. I'm hoping that the, the Corcorans and the other families, maybe some Leinster family, could, will come up with a better pedigree that we can use as a gauge. So, thank you very much for listening. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Uh, anybody have any questions for Paul? Yeah, we have a question here. This is very basic. Um, I'm sure this is working. This is a very basic question. What, what, um, what testing company do we use? Oh, um, we generally use Family Tree DNA for these type of surname projects because it is the only one of the companies that has the infrastructure to support surname projects. So Family Tree DNA would be the one to test with. Um, they are downstairs, uh, and you can get a DNA test today, so one for your brother or one of the male members of the family, or one for yourself as well. And we have a, a question down here from Kathy. A comment and a question. Um, the comment is that there's a lot of genealogical material in uh, the Book of Ballymote and the Book of Lecan, and both of those are now up on the web. And there are groups who, which exist which are doing um, paleographical transcriptions of these. Yeah. Um, and it seems to me that, that it would be very useful for groups like yours to be in touch with them um, and, and, and ask them to actually transcribe some of the material. I'm not saying that I, I, I don't believe in accurate pedigree. Yeah, that's they're, they're, they're the best we've got. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so, so maybe that would be of help. The, the other question is, is um, what do you mean by clan? What's your, def what's your working definition of clan? Well, I, I really don't uh, have, I, it could be a sept, a clan, a, 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 a shill. There's all kinds of terms, and, and uh, I, I, as near as I can find out, they're interchangeable. I've, I've asked people about that. Now, I call the, uh, the O'Byrne of Roscom, and I call them a sept because I read somewhere that that means a smaller unit than a clan, that a clan is larger. But if you've got a better definition of clan, I'd love to have it. <laughs> well, I, I don't, but I agree with you that all these terms are, are, are used very loosely. And, and it seems to me that if, if we're investigating with DNA, yeah. we need to be have more, you know, use them more precisely than, than historians have tended to do in the past. Yeah, I wish I could. Uh -huh. um, but, I mean, one of the big distinctions, for example, between clan in Scotland and clan in Ireland is that a clan in Scotland can be everybody in a given area. So when you did your map... Well, that, that's, example, what I, that's what I'm saying. I, I think the clan O'Byrne is geographic rather than, than patrilineal. That They don't all descend from the same man. Well, Most of them do, but not all. Well, you see, when, when you look at Irish families, you don't get a pattern where you have an entire valley, an entire um, area of however many acreage, where everybody has the same surname. That's mm -hmm. a Scottish pattern. It's not an Irish pattern, except in some places in Donegal. Yeah. Um, so an Irish, I mean, the word clan just means family or children. Um, but an Irish clan is not the same as a Scottish clan. Yeah. So I think as you get more and more precise in terms of the DNA, um, you're going to have to ask the historians to be more and more precise in their usage of words like this. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you're just, it's just confusion piling on confusion. Yeah. In this case, the clan always had an, had an elected leader, uh, as, as far as I know, a chieftain, so to speak, a, what do you call it, a Taishak? And uh, I, I guess I would de define clan. There's other groups known as the shill, which just, I think means seed of, doesn't it? And uh, mentor, which just means... Well, again, nobody has studied... I mean, if you look at... Sorry, I don't want to hog here. But, but um, the, 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 the word mincher, it turns up um, in uh, the 11th century, and nobody has come up with what... Uh, it, it first appears in genealogical material in the 11th century, uh -huh. and nobody has defined... It just means... It means a modern Irish family. Nobody has defined what it means in the 11th century terms yeah. when it first appears. Um, so, so there's, there's, there's a lot of work to be done on this. 
I mean, your map is a map, the early map that you had there is a map by Alfie Smith and uh, F.J. F. J. Byrne. That's, that's basically what it's based on. Yeah. But that's, what they're doing is they're taking 12th century ge genealogies and the records of Anglo-Norman uh, settlement and they're following 12th, pedigrees written down in the 12th century which say father to son to son to son inheritance going back at a guess. So when you say it's historically proven or historically agreed to AD 400, that's reconstruction by modern scholars from a 12th century genealogy. Mm -hmm. There's no 4th century source that that's based on. Yeah. So uh, this is what I was trying to say yesterday. The, 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 the history side of this is much weaker than, than some of the arguments that are being presented here would suggest. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question of all sorts sure. Prior to the Norman arrival, were there not lots of places where the land was controlled by chieftains who had the same surname and people adopted the same surname that had the same land? We, we, we as, can't, Jasky, as Jasky kind of alludes to. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, yeah. We can trace families. We cannot trace the lands that families owned in any detail, apart from saying they're west of the Shannon, they're east of the Shannon, they're north, they're south. But when you see a map, that map is based on taking <coughs> the names of people and assuming well, I'm not, I'm that... I'm not asking you about map. You said, what's the definition of a clan? Yeah. I would suggest it's a place where the, the usage of the land was controlled by people that, that adopted the same surname. But you need to know what the land is then. And I'm telling right. you, you and don't. The, you and can't. The countless names probably speak to that. No, they can't. Okay. Um, <laughs> Paddy's help me. <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's not trying to be negative for the sake of negative. It's the nature of, of, of the sources. We have references, place names in material from uh, 650 on, and some of those place names are replicated in modern townland names. Some, but we've no def We've no at the moment. We've no dating criterion for all Irish place names. We don't. There's a theory that most of them were invented by 1200, but it's only a theory. And when you look at kingdom boundaries, the kingdom boundaries, a lot of them are recorded. Uh, either in Anglo-Norman documentation um, associated with the names of families, or it's recorded in things like Keating, where they just say, from the River Shannon to the Galton It kind of froze up on me. Or something okay. like that. It's very vague. Oh, okay. And there's lots of other families interspersed what within that, that area. It's not, it, it's simply, all it's saying is that the controlling go, family the leader ruled that. Again. But it's mm -hmm. not saying there wasn't other population groups from other, um, from other families. Living in that area. Uh, I have a related question because we're seeing in your study, Paul, that there are a lot of people, a lot of Burns, who don't share the same haplotype, uh, haplogroup as the, as, the core, yeah. as the core group. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of this might be due to NPEs, non paternity events, uh, out of wedlock and illegitimate births, for example. But the other one is uh, secret adoptions. And of course, that comes back to the ancient Irish uh, fostering uh, custom. But, so this is a kind of a general question to the audience. To what extent do we think that fostering into the core group was responsible for the differences in the haplogroup assignments we see to the members of the court clan O'Burn? I don't know. I thought about that, Morris. But uh, fostering was strictly the upper classes, wasn't it? And uh, you think they would know who the child is to be returned to. The child was, was, was lent, lent or, or, or given to, uh, to some other tribe or some other family to raise, of course, to educate and so on. But uh, didn't they always go back then to, the, to, the, uh, to the, their parents eventually, the parents' tribe anyway? They should do, but of course, if they were men being fostered, they go back at 17. So they could have left traces of their passing in, 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 the, in the foster family. Well, that's true, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's another very good point because uh, uh, if an NPE, if we want to call it that, uh, occurred 2,000 years ago, then that particular uh, SNP has been passed down through all the subsequent male, male descendants of that, that, that man. And 
if his name was uh, anywhere along the line, if, the, if, if he was living in the clan area, the area that, that was dominated by the clan, then his name became usually O'Byrne or O'Toole or whatever uh, the chieftain's name was, with, with no memory whatever. I mean, he knew, who knew about such things back then? Uh, yeah, I think the, um, the key point for me would be exactly the same as the, the previous one raised, is what is this definition of a, of a clan in, in genetic terms. I think you can make it rigorous by saying what you did and, and defining it as a geographic entity. The problem then becomes that the phrase membership of a clan becomes much more fuzzy because you can bet your bottom dollar there's almost no one alive today who is 100% descended from that geographic region, mm -hmm. especially not people from other countries and other parts of Ireland. Yeah. Because, ev because everybody migrates and everybody's going to be a huge mix of everything else. So then the problem is what? where do you draw your threshold, arbitrary threshold, and say above this percent of admixed proportion, we're going to call you a member, and if you're below it, you're not a member anymore. So I, th I think it's, it's this word membership that is, uh, yeah. but it's, it's what we call in science a false dichotomy. It's, but it's the thing is, they, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't know that they, they came from different lines. They think they were the same as the neighbor or the guy in the next valley and so on, although had the name Burr O'Byrne, you know. Yeah, of course, the, the, so the, the name all, only goes across. Yeah, points. all descended from a single primogenitor. But and what surprises me is that so many, ninety-five, are do have that single primogenitor. Right. Yeah. And so I think people would be more confident. To me, that's amazing. Although you do, on the other hand, you have these people who have wine lineages yeah. from all over the world who still call themselves members. So yeah. that's uh -huh. difficult as well. I mean, it, there's there's probably a way of making it at least a, a useful thing to say, but you. I, there needs to be some kind of threshold defined, and as soon as you, as soon as we get more sequences from better geographically targeted areas, you'll, yeah. be, able to, you'll be able to say things like this based on admixed proportions. Uh, we have a question down here from John and from Jared. We'll take Jared first, and then we'll go to John. Okay. <coughs> yes, I, I tend, uh, I tend to agree with. Catherine's comment that the historians and the geneticists should work closer together. Uh, reminds me of the uh, old Oklahoma <coughs> musical, The Cowman and the Farmer Should Be Friends, right? <laughs> and, you know, we, we have a very, very big corpus of um, uh, ancient genealogy in Ireland. Uh, we, we've lost many of our mountain records, of course, but we have this very large corpus of ancient genealogy, you know, books like the Great Book of Genealogy from Kerbish. Uh, there are about 20 other excellent sources, all of the Annals in Ishpel and Ulster and so on and so forth. The challenge would be to get them digitized first, uh, online, indexed, uh, so that then, then we can link them. So I, I would return the question, Kat, and say, how can we effectively do this? You know, because, uh, you know, we, we are, are Phylogenetic tree is expanding at an exponential rate. Uh, we, we're in the middle of a SNP tsunami. <laughs> and uh, what, what we need now is, is, is the ancient records to be able to link to. Yeah. Well, would it be helpful if I, in the age of Morris, and organized a seminar you know, for all people to, to the conference next year to yeah. talk specifically about the, the texts and, and, and the evidence of the texts. So it's not just me pontificating in the corner, but that there is actually a spread of people. Yeah, would that, would that be helpful? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great suggestion, Kathy, thanks. And the, uh, a great point, Jared, as well. It's great to see that some of the ancient genealogies are being digitized and are being available online. But for everybody with a certain study, we need as many as possible so we can really do some proper analysis. Comment from John. So it will be a comment. Uh, first of all, apologies for not being here earlier. I had to feed myself. Um, <laughs> first point, in relation to adoptions. There were adoptions, informal adoptions, even in modern times, early modern times. If a couple had no children of their own and their brother or sister had a large brood, they often gave them their sure. children. Yeah. So you had this, and then they would adopt, they would take on the family name. Uh -huh. I, I people take on the family name for convenience. The second point is the surname that really didn't exist uh, 
much earlier than the Normans arrived here. Anyway, no. people were called, you know, John the son of Fred the son of so. That's that right. Was mm -hmm. the name. And then they were also called by their occupation. My name is an occupational name, mm -hmm. it means swordsman. So there were many uh, swordsmen, the sons of whoever was the parochial king. So the, the definition of a family, the families didn't need surnames because there were so few of them anyway. Yeah. They stayed in the same place. And in my opinion, I don't think it matters about the level of precision that you give to a clan that lived in a particular patch, which would vary slightly in time. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if you could define it all right, but uh, I would expect that because of the absence of surnames and the patch might be a bit different, it doesn't really matter very much. Most people know what you mean when you say a clan in Bray or wherever the O'Toole's were on the mountains and they yeah. would have moved around. That's all I want to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's what I said before, is that I, I'm really surprised that if, if our uh, main indicator was uh, 550 A.D. for the clan, that's where the, uh, the 94, 95 probably come together, most of them anyway, that, uh, that they, uh, they, they all are the same. They all are the Z16950, because you think there'd be so many adoptions and uh, other uh, illegitimacies and what have you down through the, 15, what is it, 1,500 years. That's a very, a uh, lot to be said for the women of Leinster. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Seeing as how my mother was one. Um, listen, Paul, thank you so much for right. an excellent presentation. I think you've thrown a, a lot of uh, light on, on what it means to try and reconstruct uh, a clan. Mm -hmm. And I think we've had an excellent discussion with the audience as well. We've learned a lot. We've actually made a step forward now as well towards digitization of all the the ancient annals, and I think that's a really great step forward. So can I ask you to all thank Paul Byrne for his excellent Thank you. Oh, do you want to take this off? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're muted now. Okay. So. We're, we're safe, we're in the clear. Well done.